Can I just begin by uh, extending a very warm welcome to everybody who's here this evening. It's a, a real pleasure to see so many here. And I know uh, from the conversations beforehand that you represent a whole range of different connections with, uh, with Christian, from family members I know on the front row, to uh, professional colleagues, to academic colleagues, and as I understand, quite a number of patients in the audience as well. So that's good to see so many of you. Um, particularly welcome to Keele University. This is one of our... Um, series of inaugural lectures in which we ask our newly appointed professors to talk about their area of specialism and uh, I'm sure tonight's lecture is going to be a very uh, intriguing and interesting uh, contribution to that series. Um, we're very aware that when we appoint new professors at Keele, uh, clearly we appoint them because of their fantastic expertise in their academic area, but we're very keen they also have the uh, uh, skills and ability to communicate with a wide range of audiences. And so inaugural lectures are very much about a diverse audience for the, uh, the new professor. I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Professor Christian Mallon. Christian has uh, uh, been at Keele, or been in North Staffordshire anyway, since 1999, when he came uh, after graduating from a medical school in Nottingham. And as many of you will know, uh, most of his career since coming to North Staffordshire has been as a general practitioner and he's had very strong engagement with the, uh, with the local community. But his interests in uh, the research dimensions of uh, general practice and particular, particularly in uh, musculoskeletal issues in primary care led him to become very strongly engaged with the medical school here at Keele. And uh, from 2004 onwards, he's held a variety of Arthritis Research UK uh, awards and uh, funding and uh, grants to support the work that he does. And in 2011, he was awarded an Arthritis Research UK Clinic, uh, Clinician Scientist Fellowship to enable him to continue his research in a significant way. During that time, his profile nationally and internationally has grown very, very significantly. So he's now, amongst other things, editor of the European Journal of General Practice and a review board member for the Journal of Education for Primary Care. And he's there now uh, professor and director of academic general practice and director of academic clinical training for the Faculty of Health. Christian, like many of our colleagues in the uh, Faculty of Health and associated with the medical school, is both strong in research but also makes a, a very significant contribution to the teaching and to the training of our next generation of medical students. Um, in research terms, his focus has very much been on improving the diagnosis and management of common rheumatological complaints, particularly in primary care. And I know we're going to hear something of that from his lecture this evening. Um, and he's uh, worked very much on the association between painful exposures in childhood and common conditions experienced as a young adult. But his teaching experience has also been very much uh, uh, applauded here at Keele, where he's engaged in the work of the medical school and supporting the Keele Medical Academic Pathway. And that continues into his professional practice, where he's a GP trainer in an advanced training practice. So he works with everybody from uh, new medical students to uh, very senior, well-established GPs. His work has been recognised nationally. He was the winner of the Yvonne Carter Award. And uh, his work has been, the recognition of his skills have been seen in being funded by Arthritis Research UK, uh, the National Institute for Health Research, and amongst others, the North Staffordshire Medical Institute. And he's been awarded three fellowships by the Arthritis Research UK. Now, in tonight's lecture, Christian is going to focus on the importance of primary care management for common musculoskeletal disorders, highlighting some of the local research successes and identifying future directions to improve patient care. So, can I therefore welcome, formally, Christian Mallon, our Professor of General Practice and Health Services Research, and invite him to present his inaugural lecture, From the Cradle to the Grave, the Importance of Musculoskeletal Research in General Practice. Christian. Thank you, and um, thank you, Professor Foskett, for that kind introduction, and a big thank you for everybody for turning out tonight on such a miserable October evening. I guess we should be lucky that the St Jude storm wasn't as bad as predicted, but I still really appreciate everybody coming out tonight. As people who know me will be aware, I really don't like being the centre of attention, so 
when I was first awarded the, the chair post two and a half years ago, the first thing I said to my wife was, oh no, now I have to think about doing an inaugural lecture. You can imagine my delight then for two years when I really thought I'd got away without having to do one. <laughs> Sadly, my, my lovely head of department, Elaine Hay, thinks that this is a rite of passage that I simply can't be denied. And that's why I, I'm here today talking to you. With a technology failure. There we go. Thank you. So, obviously the first challenge any new professor must have is to conquer technology. And I, I think you'll see that I've, I've done that very well. <laughs> so, during this lecture, I've decided that I won't talk about all of the research projects that I've been involved with over the last decade. Instead, I've decided to select one or two which are particularly important to me. I've chosen projects that span the life course, so highlighting how musculoskeletal pain affects children and young adults, before moving on to how musculoskeletal pain is a significant problem for older people, and particularly people with osteoarthritis. As part of this talk, I'm also going to talk a little bit about how I got to be doing what I'm doing today. It's still relatively unusual for a GP to have an academic component to their job, and I don't see why. I think it's the best combination of jobs ever, and it's something I'd encourage everybody to think about doing. So my research is strongly focused on musculoskeletal problems, and in particular, my portfolio of studies try to improve the diagnosis and the management of musculoskeletal pain in a general practice setting. Now, when we talk about musculoskeletal problems, we're really talking about a whole umbrella that, that takes problems from osteoarthritis all the way through to gout and polymyalgia. And these are problems that are especially important in general practice because this is where most of them are managed. Musculoskeletal problems are incredibly common. Looking around the room tonight, I'd be very surprised if somebody hadn't experienced any kind of musculoskeletal pain during their life. And luckily for most of us, it can be quite a short-lived experience. That perhaps with analgesia, with rest, with physiotherapy, you recover and get on with life as normal. But unfortunately, that's not the case for many people with muscle and joint problems. And they can have a really significant impact on people's daily living and what they're able to do. Now, musculoskeletal problems are particularly an issue for general practice. This is some work that was done by Calvin Jordan, one of the senior statisticians in our department. He wanted to find out what GPs did over the course of the year. Now, after respiratory problems, so coughs and colds, asthma, COPD, emphysema, he found that musculoskeletal problems were the second most common reason for going to see a GP. And that's really important. Every year, 300 million consultations occur in general practice. 90% of all NHS contacts are in general practice, although we only receive 9% of the budget, a finding that I always find quite remarkable. Around one in six consultations every day for GPs are for muscle and joint problems. So I was in practice yesterday and I saw, true to form, eight patients with these kind of disorders. So perhaps it's surprising that we don't have formal training for GPs as part of their general practice training scheme in orthopaedics or rheumatology. It simply doesn't feature. And as such, GPs are very reliant on the kind of research we do here at Keele to help inform their daily practice and guide their decision making. Indeed, despite all the work we're doing here, there's still evidence that much management is suboptimal. Now, partly that's because musculoskeletal problems often aren't prioritised by clinicians. But also there's a big gap when it comes to policy. How often in the morning do you turn on the television and see there's another £50 million injected into A&E, £100 million for cancer services? Over the last 15 years, I don't think I've ever seen a similar announcement for musculoskeletal services, despite the significant burden they have on people's lives. So as I said, the term musculoskeletal is really an umbrella under which there are loads of different disorders. Some work done by Mark Porcheret, who was previously a GP in Leek and now is a senior lecturer in our department, really shows the breadth and the depths of conditions that are seen every week in general practice. So some things are very common, low back pain, shoulder pain, osteoarthritis, and GPs need to know how to recognise those and how to deal with them. But equally, in an average week, GPs might be seeing more unusual conditions, things like osteoporosis, fibromyalgia, polymyalgia. And that's where the real challenge comes in general practice. You have to be prepared for every problem that comes through the door. Now, for me, doing musculoskeletal research is really obvious. It has a significant burden on patients' lives. It has a huge cost to the economy. And it's something that's very relevant to general practice. And that's why I decided to focus my research effort on musculoskeletal problems. But why did I decide to be a doctor? And why did I go into medicine? 
Well, it's probably no surprise to anybody in the audience that I didn't always want to be a doctor. And in fact, my brother and I spent a long time training to be astronauts when we were younger. <laughs> As you can see in our very Buck Rogers orientated 70s party or whatever we were doing. Um, but it clearly wasn't a career for me. You can tell from the picture my, my eyesight and my beautiful NHS glasses. Thank you, Mum. Um, <laughs> weren't particularly helpful, and my compulsion with tucking my spacesuit into my socks meant that I failed all the NASA health and safety regulations. <laughs> so I decided to be a doctor. Now everyone tells you that doctors and policemen are getting younger all the time, and indeed that's the case. This is me just a few years ago on my ENT rotation. <laughs> Actually, it's, it's a sad irony, isn't it, that when you first qualify as a doctor, you really want to be taken seriously, yet people just tell you you're too young. And then when you're kicking 40 like I am, you desperately want to be told that you look young, and people have stopped saying that to you. So it's getting that dichotomy right that's important. But I, I decided quite early on I wanted to be a doctor, and I, I went ahead to Nottingham University Medical School. And that's where I had my first exposure to research. Now, sadly, exposure is probably the right term for my research activities, as my friends Darren and Alison, who are sat here today from Nottingham, will tell you. I, I spent a year in a laboratory trying to find a vaccine candidate for a really aggressive bacterium called Neisseria meningitis. It causes meningitis in young adults and teenagers. I was, as you could probably tell from my technology problems earlier on, a bit of a liability in the laboratory. I broke a lot of equipment and I released very dangerous bacteria into the atmosphere all the time. And we had a couple of occasions when the labs got shut down at Queen's Medical Centre. So whilst I was keen and enthusiastic, I really wasn't very talented in a laboratory. So I had to think about what else I'd like to do that could encompass research. I think I was probably like quite a lot of our medical students at Keele. I really enjoyed most of the placements I went on. So I went from one week wanting to be an obstetrician to the next week wanting to be a psychiatrist, back to general medicine again. So actually, the choice of GP was probably fairly obvious from early on. And so I moved to Stoke-on-Trent, and moving to Stoke was complete serendipity. My wife was very keen to move to be near her sister in Birmingham. Um, her sister had just had a little girl who now is a teenager, which shows how long ago this was. I thought Stoke-on-Trent was the same place as Solihull. So I applied to Stoke-on-Trent for GP training. As was the case, you accept a post in medicine if you get it, and you honour that obligation. So we moved up to Stoke. And I think that's something I've probably never been completely forgiven for. <laughs> but as often happens in life, opportunities arise in the most unexpected places. And for me, that was the North Staff's vocational training scheme. When I started, we had three absolutely inspirational course organisers. We had Dr. Andy Bartlam, Dr. Anil Vagmaria, and Dr. Vince Cooper. And they really understood the importance of getting a research base in primary care. They really understood that there was no evidence to support what we were doing. And I guess they kind of talent spotted me and pulled me out and encouraged me to apply for extended training, which I did. So I applied to the West Midlands Deanery for an extension to my GP training to do research. And despite having a CV that nowadays wouldn't even get me shortlisted for a post, I was appointed. So I came to Kiel, and I started at Kiel on September the 11th, 2001. So a day that's widely remembered for other reasons. I came into the office, and I sat down, and I was introduced to Professor Peter Croft, who was incredibly excited about this new project and this having a new student around. In fact, Peter said that he had just the perfect project for me. It was a project he'd wanted to do all of his life, but just couldn't work out how to do it. Now, I was so naive and enthusiastic, I didn't really hear the, the, the warning bells ringing in the background. Maybe I should have been a bit cannier. But he also introduced me to George Pete. So George at the time was a young, bright epidemiologist who'd come down from Manchester. And poor George obviously had drawn the short straw in being allocated as my supervisor, not only for my MMed Sci, but also for my MPhil and my PhD. But again, a fantastic opportunity for me. I didn't only receive a phenomenal training in epidemiology, but also had somebody who was a brilliant friend, mentor, and educator throughout my career that I'm very grateful for. So my first project. I think when you do research, you either love or you hate your first project. And I, I would like to tell you where I sit on this. Peter was really interested in chronic pain, and particularly chronic pain in young adults. Now, when we talk about chronic pain in the practice, we might be talking about pain that's particularly severe or pain that's particularly disabling. But in research terms, we really refer to it as pain which is long-lasting and typically more than three months' duration. What we'd found in the literature is that nobody could really agree on how common it was, so not that unusual in a fair in research. Estimates range from between two people in 100 to 40 people in 100, so really a massive difference. So what we wanted to do was find out how common chronic pain was in the local area. Was it a problem or not? But we wanted to go one step further. We were really keen to try and find out what caused chronic pain in young adults. They're young. 
Uh, was it experiences around, life, uh, around birth? Was it things that happened in early childhood? What was it that led to them having long-lasting pain as a young adult? And so we set up a study that looks really straightforward on paper, but as often as the case, turned out to be a bit of a nightmare. What we did, we found three local general practices who were keen to participate, and we sent questionnaires to every patient aged 18 years um, to 25 years. We asked them a range of questions about their experience of health and illness, both as an adult and as a, young, um, as a child. And we also asked for permission to look at their medical records and to go back and look at their birth records. And this is when we had our first real dilemma. Nobody could tell us whether birth records were a record of a child's birth or a record of a mother's labour. And so this went backwards and forwards at ethics for quite a long time before it was decided that we could do what we wanted to do. And that's when the next, next dilemma happened. I went across to the old maternity hospital at City General, met a lovely man called John, who was in charge of medical records, and he took me down to a dungeon. <laughs> Basically, there was a cellar where they stored 100 years' worth of birth ledgers that were all handwritten. So I spent the next three months extracting data from these records. And every time I saw George and Peter and complained about it, well, I got the response, this is classic epidemiology, this is just brilliant. You know, you should be really enjoying this fantastic training. I was very sceptical then, and I'm still very sceptical now about that, to be honest. But I, but I did it. I did as was expected. And we, we had a great data set. So what did we find? Well, we found that around 14% of young adults, so about one in seven, had pain that was long-lasting. So clearly, this was a significant problem in the local health, um, health economy. We then looked at a range of different variables to see if we could try to unpick why this was happening and what was associated. So the factors in green on the screen are birth-related factors. So things like being born with a low birth weight, being premature, having fetal distress during labour or going to the intensive care unit, having an induced labour or being born by cesarean section. Now, I know there are a couple of obstetricians here this evening, and they'll be pleased to know that we don't blame them for chronic pain, because actually none of these things are associated with pain in young adults. But what we did find, and quite strong associations for childhood events. So children who had a lot of pain went on to have lots of pain as adults. Children who remembered family members having a lot of pain went on to have significant pain as an adult. Children with lots of hospital admissions or children who lost lots of time from school went on to be more unwell when they were older. And this really got us to thinking that maybe these biological factors, such as the way you're born, are less important in this age group, but the social and psychological factors are really dominant. Now, this was a great data set, so we decided we could do some other analyses and find out a bit more about what's going on. Now, I've always been interested in the association between pain and mood problems. We know that if you have pain, you're four times more likely to get depression than if you don't have pain. And we wondered if the origins for this might start in childhood. And lo and behold, actually, what we found was that children who had a lot of pain when they were children were more likely to have anxiety and depression as a young adult. So it seems that this relationship might start quite early in life. The other paper we did, which is something I was, I'm still quite excited about, because I think it's my only non-musculoskeletal publication after 80 or 90 papers, was looking at the association between birth and asthma and allergy. So what we did was identify children who had allergic rhinitis, hay fever, um, and asthma from their medical records, and went back to look at the way they were born. So there's a hypothesis that if you're not born by a normal vaginal delivery, you don't get the chance to have your body colonised with the normal bacteria that you need to develop immune response. And indeed, this is what we found in part. Our results weren't statistically significant because of our sample size, but we found that hay fever and allergic rhinitis in particular were very strongly associated with being born by a caesarean section or being born prematurely. And this is work now that's been followed up by other research groups finding very similar findings. So that was my first introduction to research, and it didn't just give me the chance to get a really strong grounding in research methodology and leading a team, but also I got to work with some really brilliant people, not just George and Peter, but also Elaine Thomas, who now heads up our CTU, Gwen Wynne jones who's just gone on maternity leave, and Sarah Muller, who I talk about a bit more later with some of her work. So after doing my MPhil and my MEDSci, I was clear that I wanted to have an academic career. <coughs> And I was very fortunate at that time to um, be awarded a place on the Brisbane Initiative, or the Oxford International Leadership Course, as it's now called. So this got a group of researchers from across the world together for a week in Oxford, where you spent time in a peer learning group, where you talk about research, planning for grants, how to write papers. And these are a group of people who are still very influential to me today. We, we keep in touch, we meet two or three times a year, and they're the kind of people that you have discussions with before you apply for a chair, for example. We spent a long time thinking about what the next important research question would be. I guess we were quite young and, and idealistic, and we really wanted there to be science that pushed boundaries. We wanted to answer questions that mattered to people. 
And it was when we were in Oxford that we think we came up with that question. And that was, does Guinness taste better in Ireland? <laughs> so people laugh, but actually this has been debated across the world for generations. This is something that people go on holiday to Ireland and they always comment on how the pint tastes so much better there than it does at home. Um, and we decided that we'd want to put a bit of methodological rigour to this. We wanted to see if this was really the case. And so, four independent assessors, someone from England, someone from Ireland, someone from Germany and the Netherlands, <laughs> tested 103 pints in 71 pubs over 14 countries. And we developed a really robust assessment process to facilitate this. So obviously we had to take a little bit of kit with us. We took a thermometer, we took a tape measure, we measured the head of the pint. We timed the time it took to pour, we looked at the temperature of the pub and the pint, we looked at the experience of the landlord and of the barmaid, we looked at training, the type of glass that the pint was delivered in, the ambience of the pub, the creaminess and the aftertaste, and then we developed a 0 to 100 overall enjoyment scale, which is really a composite measure of all of these things together. So I know you're dying to know, what did we find? Well, we found that Barack Obama was right. Guinness really does taste better in Ireland. The average scores were 73 for a pint in Ireland, compared with just 59 for outside of Ireland. So very, very conclusive findings. Now, as a, as a young researcher, that was great. When I published my other papers that I was very proud of, nobody cared, nobody read them, nobody accessed them. They certainly didn't make the news. Go and have a few pints with friends and assess a pint of Guinness, and you're all over the place before you know it. So this hit the headlines all across the world, including the BBC. So the Guardian, obviously leading on the Barack Obama line, that Barack Obama was right, Guinness really does taste better in Ireland. And my personal favourite was from the Sunday Times, and I think this is a pun worthy of a tabloid, to be honest, that pure geniuses prove their point. So that was a bit of fun. Obviously, that's not real science. It was, it was a bit of fun. But what it did do was bring together a group of people who have formed a really strong research collaboration that has lasted now eight or nine years. We're still publishing together, we're still applying for grants together, and it's something that's worked out very well. Now, I'm sure that everybody's really keen to learn more about the Guinness study, so what I'd suggest is perhaps buy me a pint later and I can tell you all about it then. I've just mentioned how we've got grants of our group in the Brisbane Initiative, and increasingly getting funding for academic work is increasingly hard in the current financial climate. Now, I've been extremely fortunate that Arthritis Research UK have funded my research almost continually. When I first applied for my PhD funding, they really took a punt on an enthusiastic but very naive researcher. And since then, they've also funded my postdoctoral work and more recently my Clinician Scientist Award. And for that, I'm always going to be grateful because having personal fellowships really helps to give you a bit of academic freedom. It allows you to decide a little bit more what you will and what you don't want to do. And so my Arthritis Research UK funded PhD was called the Progress Study. And this really saw me move away from pain in children and young adults across the pain in older people, and particularly older people with joint pain. What we wanted to do as part of the progress study was something that I think clinicians, nurses, physios, GPs across the country have thought for a long time. That when it comes to predicting the outcome of a pain, actually, most anatomical regions behave in roughly the same way. So what we wanted to assess was whether we could take a generic approach to determining an outcome in this group. So what do I mean by a generic approach? Well, what we wanted to try to do was use the same set of questions to assess the outcome of pain, irrespective of the anatomical site. So can I use the same simple screen for the knee that I could use for the hip, or the back, or the shoulder? That's got great benefits clinically. If I developed 15 tools to be used in general practice, no one would use any of them. There simply wouldn't be the time they'd got forgot about. But if I can develop a single instrument which is easy to use and easy to administer, then we're far more likely to have an impact on patient care. And so to start off with, we did a systematic review. And we did this to try to identify all of the relevant prognostic indicators. So systematic reviews are a great research methodology. They're really helpful in getting a lot of information together and really boiling it down to the bottom line message. So we identified more than 7,000 papers that being, again, young and enthusiastic at that time, I probably read in far too much detail, which is probably why I still have a bit of a reaction to systematic reviews. But what this process was, it was incredibly helpful. The 45 papers that ended up in the review identified a range of factors that could be easily used by GPs in the consultation to assess the outcome of pain. And the kind of factors that they highlighted are things that you may not be um, surprised by. So physical factors were very dominant. Things like the intensity of the pain people were having, having pain in more than one place, having pain that was long-acting. Psychological and social factors were also highlighted in the review, but the emphasis was much lower. So far, the scientific community had really focused on physical factors. 
Now, we really wanted this to be used by GPs in the consultation, by nurses and by physios. So we wanted to add a clinical um, element to this. We wanted to find out what doctors used as part of their routine assessment. And so we're very fortunate that the Primary Care Rheumatology Society facilitated this. So we got a group of 78 GPs in the same room, which is really difficult to do, and we got them to discuss musculoskeletal pain and what factors they use when predicting an outcome. They also completed some short questionnaires for us. And what they found was actually they identified a very similar range of factors, but the GPs placed much higher emphasis on social and psychological risk factors. So they thought that anxiety and depression, problems with coping, and problems with a lack of social support were far more likely to determine your outcome than, than some of the more physical factors. So what we decided to do is to combine these two together, develop a tool that could be used by GPs when they saw patients. And this is what we developed. Now, it looks really clunky nowadays, but take my word for it. Eight years ago, this was cutting-edge technology. We were the only place doing this sort of research. We got GPs to collect research data in real time in the consultation, and it was facilitated with novel IT. So we really were ahead of the game. The questions that we got GPs to ask are probably things that you might expect. So about pain intensity on a 0 to 10 scale, how bad is your pain at the moment? Pain interference, is your pain stopping you doing the things you want to do? Widespread pain and having pain for a long duration. We also got GPs to screen patients for depression because GPs were particularly adamant that they thought that was a very potent risk factor. The other thing we did was ask GPs to rate what they thought the outcome would be. GPs have a different knowledge of patients. They're used to dealing with people on a daily basis. Did they have some kind of intrinsic feeling about what the outcome would be, and could we capture that on a scale? So we did this across Cheshire. Now, I think at this time, it's really important to highlight that this technology and, and the network we have at Keele is absolutely unique. Most primary care research centres across the country would die for our infrastructure. And that's been headed by Rianne Hughes, who recently been appointed as deputy director, also co-director for the Research Institute. It's Rianne's vision and Rianne's strategy that really has made all this research possible and has allowed us to become the international force that we have become over the years. And I think we all owe Rianne a great deal of thanks for that. So what did we find? Well, we had five general practices in the central Cheshire area, and they recruited over 500 patients in just three months for us. So the take-up from GPs was phenomenal. Patients were also great when they brought into this study. They had to complete quite a long questionnaire at baseline, so just after they saw their doctor, but also at three, six, and 12 months. And rates of completion were really high, around 85%. Unfortunately, we found that most patients had a poor outcome. Almost half of people didn't get better from their pain or indeed got worse over that time frame. So can we predict what's going to happen? So these next couple of slides look a little bit complicated, but I'll, I'll talk you through them because they are quite straightforward. When we asked GPs to predict the outcome, they had an area under the curve of 0.62. And what that means roughly is that they were right about six times out of 10. So better than chance alone, but certainly no gold star. When we added in the brief prognostic assessment that we developed, we found that that improved the area under the curve. And in particular, items like pain interfering with your daily activity, pain that's widespread, or pain that's um, long lasting, particularly influenced that. And that increased the prediction to around seven out of 10. So still not great. The final thing we did was ask patients what they thought their outcome would be. So as part of the baseline questionnaire, we asked them, what do you think is going to happen to your pain in the next six months? Do you think it's going to be recovered, completely recovered, much worse, worse, and so on? And actually, this turned out to be a very canny thing to do. When added to the previous model, this increased the area under the curve to 0.8, and that's, um, it's widely accepted to be a good level of discrimination, but the model's performing quite well. So this work was recently published in JAMA Internal Medicine earlier this year, and what it really shows is that you can use this simple generic approach to help GPs determine the outcome of pain during the consultation, but that we mustn't forget the role of the patient. Patients are bringing some different information to this process that we're not capturing using our, our usual scientific methods and tools. Now, this potentially is very helpful for clinical practice. If, as a GP, I see a patient and I think they're going to have a poor outcome over the next six months, I might do things differently. I might arrange an early referral, I might get physiotherapy earlier on, I might get them back to practice sooner than I would do normally. This information is also really important to patients. George and I asked patients if they wanted to know the likely outcome, and 85% of people said yes. Now, when we tried to find out why, that wasn't because people wanted their pain to go away or because they, they just couldn't deal with it. They wanted it to know that information for really pragmatic reasons. They were caring for elderly relatives, and if they knew their pain wasn't going to get better, then they could make plans. 
They wanted to do things to their house while they were still well enough to do so. So it was very much around forward planning and being prepared for the future. So that kind of brings me up to the last few years. As well as generating an evidence base for primary care, I think as academics we have a real responsibility to also develop and nurture the next generation of clinical academics. This motley crew, I don't think will be doing anything in the near future, but I think we have to have a real eye on our undergraduates so that we can talent spot at an early age. Academic medicine's always been described as being in crisis. Over the last 10 years, we have the same number of clinical academics as we had roughly a decade ago. Unfortunately, the same thing is happening in clinical general practice. We need around 50% of all graduates to go into general practice, and we want the best. We want the brightest and the most talented. Unfortunately, at the moment, we probably have around 20% voluntarily choosing to do it, and that's a situation that we have to address in the future. Now, developing academic capacity in primary care is a real key or success story. In 2006, we were amongst the first group of elite universities to be awarded academic clinical fellowships. And what these did was allow GPs in training to get some expert research exposure, to take a little bit of time out to gain research skills. We've also been very successful on the back of that in gaining additional posts. So when there are national competitions and we apply, we've always been successful. Of all the things I'm proud of, I think, most of my career, it's helping to develop the Keele Academic Pathway. I'm sure Val won't mind me saying that as a new medical school, getting research into the curriculum is a challenge. We don't have that same infrastructure. We don't have that same tradition as older medical schools. And what a group of us have been doing for the last couple of years is working really hard to make ap academic opportunities for everybody around, so from undergraduates all the way through to people completing their specialist training. This has been supported by some of the initiatives we're involved in. So I'm currently secretary for the Society for Academic Primary Care, and we've got a real mission statement about getting scholarship back into general practice. I'm also training lead for the School for Primary Care Research, and over the last five years, we've invested nearly £10 million in developing the best clinical and non-clinical junior academics. So we really do have an eye on the future. When I look at these pictures along the bottom, these are our past and our current trainees, and they're a group that I'm incredibly proud of. And it's really nice to sit here and be able to see that the future of academic general practice is really safe in their hands. So I guess that kind of brings me up now to the future and what's going to be happening. I've talked about some research that I'm particularly proud of, and I've talked about our need to develop capacity. But what are my next steps? I think one of the problems may be of growing up in a small research institute and, and never having worked anywhere else is that it can be quite hard to carve out a niche for yourself. When I look around our senior executive group, we have, we have George, who's an international researcher in osteoarthritis, Daniela, who's a leading expert in prognosis, Nadine, who's one of the most talented trialists of our generation. You kind of wonder, where can I fit and where can I carve out a part for me? And I've been very lucky that Elaine Hay, our director, has really encouraged and supported me and, dare I say, pushed me a little bit into finding my own area that I can concentrate on and develop. So the area I've chosen is around inflammatory arthritis. So a different set of conditions that pre until now we haven't really looked at in the centre. So to date, there's almost no research data on inflammatory arthritis in primary care. It's simply been neglected. All of our findings are from secondary care cohorts, and they're based on patients who aren't generalisable to our kind of patients that we see in the community. So what we've done over the last two years is develop a new programme of work focusing on three conditions, on polymyalgia rheumatica, on gout, and on rheumatoid arthritis. What I thought I would do is, rather than going into detail on some of these studies, just give you a quick overview of what we've got planned for the future, a bit of a look into the crystal ball. Now, polymyalgia rheumatica is a really disabling condition that affects people over the age of 50. It's characterised by severe pain and stiffness in the shoulders and the hips. Patients with PMR can't roll over in bed. They can't get off the toilet by themselves. And this can come on over a course of just a couple of weeks. So it's a devastating diagnosis to lots of people. I got interested in polymyalgia because of one of our patients in the practice. She was newly diagnosed and came to ask me some questions about her condition. She wanted to know very basic information. What's my chances of having a relapse? How long will I be on steroids for? What are the likely side effects I'm going to experience over the next couple of years? And hand on heart, I couldn't tell her any of those things. We simply didn't have the evidence to support it. And that really led to us thinking about developing a programme in this area. So at the moment, we have a number of projects um, around polymyalgia. Dr Toby Helliwell, who's a partner in the practice at Kingsbridge, um, and also a graduate of our academic training scheme, is looking at the current management of polymyalgia. Now, this is a really important starting point for us. We want to know what's happening in practice so that we can identify good areas 
and identify areas where we can improve care for patients. Adam Hancock, who was one of our very first intercalating medical students, who now is a junior doctor in Manchester, has been looking at the association of polymyalgia rheumatica with vascular disease. Now, we know that people who have other inflammatory forms of arthritis have two or three times the risk of heart attacks or strokes than other people. No one's looked at this so far in polymyalgia, and what it looks like from Adam's work is that the risk is very similar. And as this research gets published, you can see it having a major impact on the way we deal with these patients. The other work we're doing is looking at the natural history of polymyalgia. So that's work that's led by Sarah Muller and by Sam Hyder, a consultant rheumatologist at the Haywood. And we're trying to answer the kind of questions in this study that my patient was asking me. How long do patients have symptoms for? How quickly will I respond to steroids? Will I get side effects? So all really important clinical information. We've also developed a programme of work around gout. Now, gout is probably the most painful form of acute arthritis. Again, it comes on really quickly, perhaps overnight. And the characteristic presentation is a big, swollen, big toe typically, red and very painful. You can't put your socks on, you can't walk on it, it's so painful. Now, we have a range of drugs that treat gout really well, but for some reason, they're just not used properly. Only one in three patients with gout are probably treated as they should be. So a lot of work to be done on that area. The really exciting thing for me about developing a programme of work around gout is that I've had the chance to work with Ed Roddy, who is a consultant rheumatologist at the Haywood, who I trained with at Nottingham. And it is regarded as one of the top leaders in gout research and gout clinical practice across the world. So we've had a lot of fun putting together a series of studies. So at the moment we have um, Jenny Little and Jane Richardson, who are social scientists, and they're exploring patients' experiences of living with gout. Gout is still associated with terrible stigma and awful stereotypes. You think about your classic gout patient and they're overweight, they're living a good lifestyle, they're drinking too much alcohol. And we know that's not true. Furthermore, those kind of stereotypes are really unhelpful. It, they stop people seeking medical care and getting the right treatment. So we're trying to unpick exactly what's going on in that study. Priyanka Chamrata, who's one of our academic rheumatology trainees, is looking at health-related quality of life in patients with gout. She's got a large group of patients that she's following up over a couple of years to see how gout impacts on people's day-to-day -day lives. Ed is doing a really important study, which actually probably should have been done 30 years ago. There are two groups of drugs that we commonly use to treat gout, anti-inflammatories such as naproxen and colchicine, which is derived from the crocus. Now, there have been lots of studies of different types of anti-inflammatories against each other, but no one's actually done a head-to-head -head comparison as to which is the best drug to use first. So again, these findings have the potential to really impact on what we do clinically. And Lorna Clarson, another local GP who's come through our academic clinical pathway, is looking at the association of gout with vascular disease. We know that if you have gout, you're more likely to have heart attacks and strokes, and what Lorna's trying to do is identify groups at higher risk. And so the other area that we talked about was rheumatoid arthritis. And this is really a program of work that we've developed in collaboration with the University of Birmingham, particularly Professor Kareem Ravza, who's here today. Rheumatoid arthritis treatment has changed dramatically over the past few years. We now know that if we can catch symptoms at a very early stage, typically before 12 weeks, we could almost switch off the disease. I mean, that's some kind of holy grail, isn't it, to actually turn off this process. The difficulty is, though, identifying patients that early and getting them through to specialist care to be assessed. So we have a number of projects addressing these issues. Sarah Muller is trying to identify whether there's a prochrome or a preclinical RA state in which we can identify patients in general practice and get them rapidly referred across to specialist care. Dr. Rebecca Stack and Professor Kareem Raza are looking at reasons why patients delay when they develop these symptoms. So we know that one of the major reasons why patient, people don't get treated within 12 weeks is because patients are delayed going to see their doctor. And that feeds really nicely into work that's being done by Gwenda Sermons, also at Birmingham. Gwenda's trying to find out what it means to people when they develop these symptoms. We know that if people get a facial droop or sexual crushing chest pain or rectal bleeding, these are seen as being really potent red flags. These are emergency symptoms. These need immediate medical attention, and people get help care appropriately. When somebody gets an acutely swollen joint, it doesn't have the same response. And what we want to try to do is unpick some of the reasons behind this. And to complement that, Sam Hyder is going to be doing some work with GPs to try to find out barriers in GPs making a timely diagnosis. Now, the final project I want to briefly mention is something called the Collaboration for Leadership in Applied Health Research and Care, or the CLARC, as we call it, because it's a bit of a mouthful of always. This is a really exciting initiative that we've just heard about at Keele. So we put a bid in with the Universities of Warwick and the University of Birmingham, 
and we heard a couple of months ago that we were successful. Now, the Clark brings a lot of money. It brings around £10 million in research findings. But more importantly, the Clark attracts local interest from the NHS. So when we were writing the Clark and developing the studies, we went to all of our local NHS partners, and we've got a real commitment and match resources to rapidly translate our research findings into practice. Now, this translation of evidence into practice is key. You often hear about drugs that were developed in the 70s and 80s but weren't widely used until the 90s or the noughties, and that's something that's got to change. We can't sit on the best evidence anymore. We need to get it rapidly into practice to improve patient care. And what the Clark is, it's a real opportunity for us to have a vehicle to operationalise that. So my, my last couple of slides. And to, to conclude, I really just wanted to, to extend some thanks to people. First of all, to my clinical base at Kingswick Medical Practice. I still find being a clinical academic really challenging, and I wouldn't be able to do it without the support of a really brilliant practice. With our administration team, who it's really difficult for them having a doctor who's only in one day a week, and the partners, past, present and future, who really have supported and encouraged this career. It's, it's not easy for them having somebody who's, who's there far less than they should be, and they've always been very supportive and, and helped me out in every way that they can, and I really appreciate that. The other group I really want to thank are my patients, many of whom have come out tonight. We do the research we do at Keele because we really are committed to trying to improve outcomes for patients with musculoskeletal problems. And I hope that after this lecture you'll see that the work we're doing here is really worthwhile. Um, I hope you'll realise that I do work four days a week and that GPs aren't paid so much I can afford to just do the one day, as some people think. And I, and I, I do own a suit and I do very occasionally wear it, although probably not as often as I should do. I also want to thank my family and friends, particularly my wife Angela. Poor Angela's ended up not living in her, her wonder place of Birmingham, but ending up in Stoke-on-Trent. And she's also had the dubious honour of having to read all three of my dissertations. And that's something you wouldn't wish on your worst enemies, let alone somebody you love. So thank you, Angela, for all of your support. And finally, it's really clichéd, but I do work with a wonderful group of people. Um, I've tried to highlight people I work closely with across the course of this lecture, and I thought I missed out people. I'm very sorry for that. The executive team in the centre are working really well, and I'm really excited about the future and what we can deliver. I have a wonderful PA, Sue, who has organised tonight, um, and who looks after me. And I, I do need looking after on a day-to-day -day basis, and Sue is brilliant at that. Um, and also extending my thanks to senior members of the Faculty of Health, particularly Andy Garner, Bob McKinley, and Val Ross. As a new professor, it's nice to know that their doors are always open and they're always willing to help. Thank you very much. <laughs>